We're going to go ahead and get started in order for us to uh, accommodate everyone's schedule. We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. My name is Richard Lynch. I am the partner in charge of Thicket's not-for-profit and higher education practice. And again, we um, appreciate everyone joining us for best practices for fiduciary oversight over 403B plans. Um, before we get started, I do have a few housekeeping items that we need to run through just to make sure everyone is aware of how to use the GoToWebinar panel. Slides are available in the handout section of the GoToWebinar panel. Um, this webinar is accredited for CPE and HRCI credits. Um, HRCI activity ID and information is located in the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel. And if you are seeking CPE credit, uh, there will be three polling questions throughout the presentation as well as an evaluation at the conclusion of the webinar that will need to be completed in order for you to get that, that credit. Um, this webinar will be recorded for your reference, and so you'll be able to get access to that if there's other information you'd like to look up um, at a later date. Please submit any questions you have during the presentation um, using the questionnaire, uh, question area on the GoToWebinar panel. Um, and just as a reminder, this webinar that's taking place right now is geared towards the general not-for-profit 403B. There will be a tailored webinar for higher education institutions taking place at 1 p.m. Obviously, if your schedule is better for this webinar, you're welcome to join either of those. Um, however, if the 1 o'clock time frame fits um, your industry better for the higher education market, um, please participate um, in that webinar. There are a few uh, slight differences between the two that we would like to adjust. Uh, one of the reasons I think is important before we dive into some of the, 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 the real um, meat and potatoes of the presentation is why um, Sikich and Plan Pilot have partnered together here to present this webinar. And, and we'll touch on that in, in a little bit as we go through the process, but we're hearing more and more questions and more and more activity about um, some of the new 403B requirements and some of the new regulations requiring um, uh, uh, surrounding the 403B. And so we um, decided that it would be wise for us to get in front of uh, those in individuals practicing the industry to make sure that they're aware of some of the challenges and some of the opportunities and some of the things they should be seeing coming down the pri pipeline. Um, so we brought together two presenters here today to bring some of that information to you. Um, first, we have Karen Ch Sanchez, who is a CPA here at Sikich, and she's in charge of our Employee Benefit Plan Service Team. She oversees the Employee Benefit Plan Audit Team as well as the Compliance and Consulting Services for Retirement and Welfare Benefit Plans for a variety of industries, including not-for-profits and higher education institutions, colleges, and universities. We have Bill Karsten, he's a Senior Consultant with Plan Pilot. He has over 24 years of financial industry experience assisting financial officers and businesses professionals with managing and reducing risk inherent in their organization. Um, both of these individuals have uh, been involved with a number of the clients I have dealt with and have uh, had a great deal of, of luck helping them through some of the challenges they've experienced in the 403B market. So with that, I'll turn it over to them to begin the presentation. Good. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Richard. We're going to start off with a quick polling question here to make sure that we fit in uh, CPE for those folks that, that need to have it available. Just to keep things a little bit lighter here, we're going to go with sort of the holiday theme with some of these questions as we're starting to enter into that season. Uh, so the first polling question uh, that you should see here is that approximately how many pounds of candy corn are produced each year? Um, we've given you a few options so you don't have to think really, really hard. Oh, by the way, you will we'll receive your CPE regardless of whether or not you get the right answer or not with respect to the questions, so don't worry. Just take a stab at it. Uh, so we've got options uh, 5 million, 15 million, 35 million, or, or 50 million. So we'll let you take a quick minute there to, to put your guess in here as to uh, what you think might be the option there. And it looks like most of the folks did get the right answer with the 35 million uh, area. So hopefully you didn't all uh, personally engage in that much consumption of the candy corn as we just passed the Halloween um, uh, holiday, but um, enjoyed a little bit of it. So anyway, with further ado, um, as Richard said, I've spent most of my career here with Sikich in the employee benefits area, and while I have not seen 403Bs from the very beginning dates that we're going to talk about, I have seen much of this uh, progression, um, and so I wanted to take a minute to cover some of that background with you, fo with you folks first. 
Um, and then spending some time on sort of the, the newest emerging issue to focus on today is some of the uh, evolution of the pre-approved 403B plan documents. Uh, we'd be amiss of not talking about what the IRS is looking for in 403B plans as well, so I wanted to touch, uh, go over some of those current um, evolving topics that the IRS has reported that they're finding. And then um, about the second half of the presentation will be Bill highlighting uh, some of the best practices from a fiduciary oversight. Um, we do see that as a significant evolving area uh, in the not-for-profit markets when we first started auditing those plans and we said what are you doing for your fiduciary oversight I, we sort of got this blank look back in 2009 say I don't have to do anything so you know we have evolved quite a bit from from where we started in that process and I think most folks are acknowledging that they need to do some things and we've got clients that are at various stages of, of that process so we wanted to go over you know some of the best practices in that area as well um, and, and Bill's been a great resource to, to share some of those um, processes with our clients in that regard. So, so we'll jump right in um, and see So some of the background here um, with regard to the uh, 403B plans where we um, have evolved. Just a second while I'm getting my computer to cooperate with me. Oh, needed to move beyond that question. I need one more slide. Okay, so kind of the timeline of, of where the plans have gotten to. As I said before, I was not here in 1958 in terms of when Congress added the 403B plans, um, but this kind of shows you some of the pace at which sort of, sort of the IRS has addressed the 403B plans. You know, they were initially introduced in 1958. We started to get some of the regulations out in the mid-60s. ERISA, uh, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, um, you know, arrived around that time, and that really applied to all retirement plans and created really the foundation of many of the rules that we're following, not only in the 401k side, but the 403b side today. Um, the next kind of stepping stone was in 2001. We had uh, some sort of sweeping changes in the retirement plan area. And then along about 2004, the IRS started to pay more attention to the 403b area, and we started to have the proposed regulations announced. Three years later, we got the final regulations on that area. There was a lot of back and forth during that time frame. And then those regulations became effective in 2009. That's when your plan document requirements kicked in. That's when the audits started to be imposed with respect to those larger plans to accompany the 5,500 filings. And so if we fast forward to today then, um, we've gone from 2009 all the way to 2017 that it took the IRS to produce some of these pre-approved documents. So we've been in this sort of holding pattern and, and, and sort of remedial amendment period is what they refer to it during this time where the IRS gives our not-for-profit plan sponsors an opportunity to do the best you can um, in this period of time. But now that these new documents are going to be out, it's important to start updating things to make sure that, that we're meeting everything that needs to be handled on a go-forward basis. Um, so just to make sure we're all familiar with the same language and terminology, so ERISA imposes a number of requirements on plan sponsors, uh, um, including 403B plans. Um, most today, in today's environment, most 403B plans of tax-exempt organizations have indicated they are subject to ERISA. In those earlier days, there was a lot of question uh, on some of those situations about whether or not organizations were exempt or not from those requirements. So in general, you are subject to ERISA unless you absolutely have no employer contributions in your plan and you have very limited employer involvement. We went through a lot of analysis with clients in that pre-2009 phase to determine the extent of their involvement. Oftentimes we, we identified that you know, just the mere approval of distributions and loans and certain things like that would subject folks to ERISA. So I think in today's environment, as I said, most people are viewing themselves as subject to ERISA. The DOL has given some specific guidance outlining these requirements um, that I've listed here. There are a number of, under the umbrella of tax-exempt organizations, there's various types. So wanted to also, I think some of the folks that are on the call today may be with governmental entities. So governmental plans are always exempt from ERISA. It's always interesting that the government exempted themselves from all the rules that they put out, but it's my side note. Um, so many things we'll talk about today while, you know, a lot of the things that Bill will cover in the fiduciary best practices, you probably could apply to the government sector, although you're not necessarily subject to ERISA, but it creates this sort of best practices framework that could be adopted in other areas. Um, churches are generally exempt from ERISA, although they have the opportunity to um, be subject to ERISA. And then church-controlled organizations, so some of the 
private colleges that are controlled by a church organization or medical groups that are controlled by, a, by the church um, are also exempt and that was ratified again by a recent US Supreme Court case decision which was great news for some folks that it was kind of questionable for a while whether they weren't or weren't and went all the way up to the Supreme Court who did um, sort of bless that arrangement if you will that, that they can continue to have the protection of the, the church exemption from them. Um, we're going to talk about some of the non-discrimination rules that relate to 403B plans and I just wanted to frame it on this slide a bit that depending on what type of um, employer you are, whether or not a government plan or a church plan or some other tax exempt organization, some of the things we're going to talk about today you may or may not be subject to them. So church plans are not subject to these rules, government plans are only subject to the compensation limit category and if you don't fall into one of those you need to follow you know, all the, the requirements that we're talking about here today, but I didn't want anybody to panic thinking they're not following something you know, if you fall into one of these other categories. So assuming you are subject to ERISA, this is just kind of a laundry list of some of the highlights of areas uh, that you'd be subject to under ERISA. You have certain vesting requirements you need to satisfy. I already mentioned your 5500 filing and that audit requirement. Uh, for those of you lucky enough to be uh, subject to that requirement and get to have you know folks like us visit you uh, each year. Um, the plan document requirements out there which creates a summary plan description requirement for your participants, uh, summary in your report, just a number of different things that I think most people you know are familiar with, um, depositing deadlines, making sure you're sending in money as soon as administratively feasible, subject to the same rules. Um, as, as what we've historically seen 401k plans. Really that's the evolution of the 403b plans I think is that the IRS and the DOL kind of wants to catch them up to where the 401k plans have been from an oversight perspective not only from a regulatory perspective but also the plan sponsors responsibilities. Um, believe it or not there actually are advantages of being subject to ERISA. You know, we've got this laundry list of things that you must do but sort of some of the benefits of that and some of the reasons that organizations may voluntarily subject themselves to ERISA is that it gives, ERISA provides you know sort of a federal standard of what the requirements are and I think a little bit more um, guidance and best practices about what you what protections you may have that if you satisfy certain things like bill will cover you know later in the presentation that that protect gives you, provides you certain protections against participant suits um, things of that nature if you're not subject to ERISA then you know it's it's sort of a little bit more of the wild west if you will that you know you're subject to a, very, a variety of different state laws which could vary from one to another um, you have certain different legal protections under ERISA than you might have under state law um, within that. Every time I talk to risk attorneys they always kind of tell me it's not a bad thing to be subject to ERISA and there's, and there's certainly good aspects of it so it's not all bad. Um, so jumping into the plan document area um, you know since we, we've done obviously these audits since 2009 and we've seen all sorts of interesting things when we look at our clients plan documents uh, so before 2009 there weren't any so as we approached that deadline a lot of clients all of a sudden needed to put a lot of things together and we saw varying degrees of maybe the um, level of accuracy in some of those documents uh, as we were looking at some of those first audits some plant sponsors were surprised that certain things appeared in that document they had one prior to 2009 that said one thing and all of a sudden their vendor updated this document and they didn't read through every line on it and all of a sudden it might have said something different that wasn't necessarily approved. Um, in 2009 the IRS did give this some, some uh, protections if you will in this transition period um, where we've been operating what they refer to as good faith compliance so you're doing your best um, there's some room for error that can be fixed um, and so since 2010 we've kind of been in what they refer to as this remedial amendment period so you get some free passes on different things uh, throughout that period because also the IRS recognizes they didn't tell you what the rules were in terms of what your language needed to say in the document so they can't hold you to that standard when they didn't tell you about what language you were supposed to have. Um, in 2013 the IRS came out with the, the parameters of what would be involved in this pre-approved plan program which is really what's been in the 401k environment for many years. Um, essentially the IRS um, Vendor, there's a number of different third-party vendors out there that the attorneys write the documents, they write an adoption agreement that tells you all the options you can select within your particular plan provisions and then there's the longer plan document with all the legal code sections and requirements that have to be in there and those vendors send it over to the IRS and the IRS gives what they call an opinion letter that says they will not question the form of the language 
that is in that document. If they come out to audit you, they're not going to say, well, you're missing this provision in the language of your document. You have the protection under this opinion letter that's been provided. So firms like ourselves, for when we uh, provide the third-party administration service for 403B plans, we submitted our application and we have our sickage opinion letter that our clients will be using with respect to those documents. Um, there's a separate rule called a determination letter, which is when each plan sponsor might submit their own application to the IRS where your letter would actually say, you know, ABC, um, not-for-profit organization, here's your letter. They actually do not offer those in the 403B plan market, and they're really getting away from it in the, in the um, for-profit sector as well, and they really want folks to fit their parameters into these pre-designed, pre pre-approved plans from an efficiency perspective. Um, so the goal is to move your plan onto some of these documents to ensure that you have the protections um, outlined by the IRS. Uh, the IRS approved most of these plans um, had been submitted years before and the IRS was working through the language with all those counsel for the last um, probably you know, a couple of years, I think we sent in our application several years ago, uh, waiting for that approval letter. So most of those came out in the spring this year. And then the IRS gives us a three-year period to, to convert all of our clients onto those documents. Uh, and so we'll be referencing some of these retroactive dates of certain these provisions, again, to kind of predate this all the way back to 2009, where we said, oh, this language is actually in place back in 2009, and we operated it in accordance with these things. Prior to this, we really didn't have much IRS guidance in terms of what language needed to be in there, so attorneys probably saw divergence in practice, and they all had their own interpretations. And I just want to say, I, I would just take note of that March 30th, 2020 date. That's a key one to uh, get out in front of and, and just be sure that, that you're looking at uh, you know, what protections you can get offered under a volume submitter document and, and make plans accordingly well in advance of that date. Yeah, good point, Bill. And as time flies, and it will be in 2020 before you know it. And, you know, most, most of your vendors that you're using uh, under current documents, most of those will probably be reaching out to you. I know we've got it on our agenda to reach out to our clients. Uh, in the near term to, to advise them of the timing and the deadline and the process to go through the restatement. Um, just as a side note, in the 401k environment, we all just went through restating all of our clients' plans, and we finished those in the spring last year. So really just gone through this restatement process, all the 401k plans have. Um, guidance is just coming out now from the different plan document vendors. I know our team attended one a couple weeks ago with regard to our vendor. So you may not have heard yet from your vendors with respect to those documents, but I think it's key to make sure you understand who's, if you're on sort of the list, to make sure that you're going to be receiving information to get your plan document up, updated. Uh, most of the vendors now seem to be offering that as a part of their process, but it's, it ultimately it's your responsibility to make sure you have the document. So to Bill's point, make sure that got that flagged that that somebody's reaching out to you in the, in the coming years uh, to make sure that gets handled. One thing to take into account when you do go through that process, one of the first questions on that form is likely going to be what's the effective date of the plan and you can have some and so depending on what date you use in there it's going to have, give you a different level of reliance on some of that language. So you don't need to go all the way back to 2009 because the IRS gave you some some uh, grace period, if you will, for 2009, but you likely want to make your restatement back to 2010 because that's when this um, reliance period really ended. And so while you think, well, I should really make my effective date in 2018 or 2019, you know, when I'm actually working on the document, you may want to take note to make sure you get this retroactive reliance back to these prior dates to make sure you have all the protections of all these gap years and you're not just, you know, looking forward to make sure you've got coverage on all those. It also gives you a great opportunity to document some of those things that may have changed or evolved over the years. You know, did you change plan provisions during that point in time to make sure you're documenting things that were in effect throughout that entire window of time. This is kind of your free pass to clean up any housekeeping items you may have had um, over those prior years that might not have been quite tidied up over there. Um, you know, after this point in time, you know, you're, you're on the new document and, and we no longer have some of those good faith uh, protections that we had in prior years. Your, your document, when your provider um, forwards that into, you know, many of these things were in your prior document, um, but some of the, these are some of the key areas that you're going to see in that document. You've got to define basically how everything works. Um, eligibility, your benefits, limits, loans is, a, is one that we see varying levels of, um, is it in here, or, or, you know, what 
what does your investment custodian accounts include and then what does your plan document include sometimes are, are very different um, you know how do your distributions work I know in our prior document they often just defaulted back to what the um, individual contract might have shown but we know that those language also has to be in the plan document so we're going to be seeing some updates of things um, in the area of the distributions um, there's in most plan documents you're likely going to see an appendix that outlines some different administrative functions making it a little bit easier to give some flexibility about how you actually administer things from more of a policy perspective versus so, sort of the legal provisions of, of eligibility and those sort, sorts of things you're probably also going to see an appendix that lists all the different invent, investment vendors that you have under the plan as we've seen the evolution of 403b plans you know you may have several different custodians because you may have set up your investments under an individual account model versus a group platform and with that you can't force folks to change off of one investment product so you may have some legacy contracts out there um, and make sure that your document is covering really all those legacy contracts that have been under the umbrella of the plan and so you may need to be listing multiple investment vendors under your document to make sure that those are covered and then make sure all the provisions of those different investment vendors are all reflected in the in the plan. Uh, the IRS has said that the plan document is going to control if it conflicts with those investment provisions. So this is this is probably where Bill's going to be spending a great deal of his time assisting clients with making sure that understanding what those custodial agreements say and that 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 um, isn't conflicting with the provisions of the plan document and giving some you might need some clarifying language incorporated if there's conflicting provisions within each investment contract. You know, you could have one that has joint and survivor annuity requirements and one includes loans and, and a variety of different um, contradicting information. So Bill's going to have some great years coming up helping clients <laughs> through this and I'm sure we will as well. Yeah. Um, so those are some areas to in, in particular to focus on that I think will be some of the challenges of making sure that we've got things um, narrowed down. So really focus your, your investment advisor is going to be a key component of this plan restatement process as well as I know our clients will be reaching out to us as well we hope because um, we'd be glad to review those as a part of our clients process before you sign those if we're going to be doing your audit we'd love the opportunity to you know work with you first to review those so we can be part of the the solution instead of giving you the bad news you know a year later that that something might have been missed in the process um, this sounds very elementary but really the the key thing here is to if there's any takeaway is to really read that document thoroughly before you sign it making sure you really understand what those plan provisions are saying um, look at those plan provisions and really just take a, a walkthrough of your current existing plan operations again it seems very elementary but you know when we go through this audit process we you know point out what that provision says and then that's oftentimes not what plan sponsors are doing we saw this with when we had well when we had the 2009 documents with respect to the 403b plans that first year through many times there was things you know software vendors are going to you know update this from your old system onto the new and one would think things would magically map over but not with technology not not everything sort of always ends up where it needs to be and there's new options and features that are you know written to the new language so it's really critical that while painful as it may be, you really need to look at every option that's in there because depending on one little X in the wrong box, it can have a significant cost impact um, from a compliance perspective in making some of these corrections. The IRS is going to say whatever you picked is, is the law with respect to your plan and that's what, what you're supposed to be following. So some common issues to really focus on as, as you're taking a look at those documents. You know, our, our is just 44 pages long, so that can be kind of daunting. And then, um, but to really kind of drill into these are some of the areas that we saw some issues with um, over the years. Um, some of our, our clients credit service with prior with, when they worked for other similar um, tax exempt organizations, and so making sure that you've credited. Uh, service properly and that those provisions are being handled. Um, com definition of compensation, lots of opportunities for things to go wrong, loans, um, how you handle contributions and distributions, things of that nature. One area I just wanted to highlight real briefly, we do see some issues with the universal availability concept. Generally in the 403B arena, everybody who contributes at least $200 a year must be allowed immediately into the plan and there's sort of notice requirements to make elections along there. So we've seen some issues with clients along there. There are certain eligibility um, to exclude certain categories, so your student employees, folks that work less than 20 hours, things like that. 
but making sure that whatever you're doing in operation, you really got to make sure that that's documented in the plan as well. You know, auditors like documentation, but you know, it really does save you when you go through audits. Um, so you can include certain employees, but just again, make sure that it's it fits the criteria in the plan and your operations meet those as well. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the contribution limits that are out there. The IRS did just recently announce their 2018 limits, and we saw a slight increase in the salary deferral limit and the overall plan limit uh, that's out there. Um, there are a couple of different catch-ups available um, to allow contributions in excess of those limits I just mentioned with respect to 403B plans. You have the regular age 50 catch-up, and then certain qualifying organizations, most of you on the call, schools, um, health and welfare, church-related organizations, hospitals, have these other sort of special elections uh, for folks that have at least 15 years of qualified service. Um, I listed some of the rules here for your reference so you get a little bit of an increase. Um, we find some issues with some of these as, as well as the IRS does on them. So there's a lot of bookkeeping and a lot of details to kind of walk through if you're, if you're trying to use those special limits. That is something that's optional in your plan document if you want to allow those or not, but just obviously if you allow, make sure that you've got a process to administer them. I listed, and these are just direct excerpts off of the IRS website in terms of what they're seeing in terms of the issues, which I think is always a good way to kind of compare back against your current practices, because um, in an, the event of an IRS audit, these would be the things they would, would likely be focusing on. Obviously, making sure your folks are not exceeding those dollar amounts that we just talked about, the 18000 moving to the eighteen five, along with the catch-up limits. Um, was, was the first item they noted. The universal availability item, they're indicating that, that they're not seeing that all employees are automatically be given that right immediately, not understanding those requirements, not letting people in soon enough, um, making sure that folks are not exceeding those contribution limits that we mentioned, the 54,000 uh, for 2018, 53 in prior years. Uh, plan loans, not quite following some of the rules that are out there. Um, you know, failure to get the payments in timely and just not understanding and administering that process, particularly when you got multiple vendor relationships and making sure your participants aren't taking loans from different ones and, and not having that coordination effort happening. Uh, hardship distributions continue to be some issues. There's some of the vendors don't require all the documentation to be done when it's taken and they put that onus back on the uh, plan sponsor and the plan sponsor believes that the vendor is is providing that information um, making sure that uh, you've got documentation with regard to those those issues um, 457F plans were another area so if you've got sort of the non-qualified version of some additional uh, deferral plans they've seen a lot of violations um, with respect or operational failures in that area as well um, again, some other 457 plan issues in here as well. And then the uh, number nine, annuity contracts, again, not meeting the requirements um, of what needs to happen in there. I think a lot of folks, those annuity contracts can be kind of scary to read. I know it's not my favorite thing to do, and they're very lengthy, and sometimes it's just really hard to get your hands on what those were when they've been out there for a lot of years when you may have had transition at your organization. And then last one was just ineligible plan sponsors of a number of these different entities. So you've got to obviously be falling under you know, the 501c3 category, uh, hospitals, educational institutions, et cetera, in order to make sure you're sponsoring some of these entities. So we'll go to our next polling question here. Um, so this will be a nice, easy, true or false one. So Thanksgiving is celebrated on the fourth Thursday in December in November, not December, in thir fourth Thursday of November in the United States. So um, folks think that that item is true or false. We'll give people a chance to take a look at that as I pass the reins over to Bill here as well to lead you through the fiduciary area. All squared away. Ho hopefully almost everybody got that right because <laughs> I know a lot of people's mothers are counting on, on you to know that. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone you're in. I know we have people here from both. Uh, I'll start out with the first, with a 15-second overview of, of my section here. For, for those of you who might have to, to jump off early, uh, it really comes down to process and documentation. Uh, and, and what we mean is, is your keys to uh, proper fiduciary oversight are to establish and follow defined processes, and then to document your discussions and your decisions. 
if you're doing those two two things, you will be well positioned, and certainly we'll go into some more detail here as, as we go further through the presentation. So the first uh, item, who is a fiduciary? And, it, and it's very important, uh, especially if you are a fiduciary to your plan, to recognize who is serving in that capacity and, and who is not. Um, so st let's start with your record keeping provider. You know, that they are serving really in an administrative capacity and they are avoiding uh, fiduciary liability and, and avoiding that fiduciary status other than that there may be an exception uh, where you have uh, financial advisors or counselors uh, that, that uh, from your record keeping provider that, that come to your uh, campus or on site at your organization to, to provide those services so that there may be a, uh, exceptions but in general your record keeper would not act in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, the, the other item that, that's important to understand is it's really the actions that dictate whether you are a fiduciary. I mean, obviously, if you're named and you've signed on to be a fiduciary to, to serve uh, over your plan, you, you're in that role. But, but also recognize, um, you know, if you're in a position, if you're interpreting plan documents or if you're providing advice uh, related to the plan or to participants, those actions will, will put you in that, that fiduciary chair. Uh, you know, in terms of others, that, that's where when it comes to a consultant, certainly you want to understand to what extent that in a consultant or advisor is serving in a fiduciary capacity. Uh, and it's very critical when, when you're looking to, uh, to take guidance and, and advice from them to, to understand that they are also serving in that fiduciary role with you or if they're not. Uh, the other item here to, to understand is you can never fully delegate away your responsibility. The plan sponsor is always in that fiduciary role. Uh, so you know, ne never believe someone who would say, well, just delegate that responsibility to me and you're off the hook. If, if you're in a fiduciary role, you still have to oversee your service provider. So at a minimum, you would always have that fiduciary responsibility. So next, I know we have uh, some who have joined us today who have non-ERISA or church plans. And so just a, a couple points that I want to make here. First and foremost, we, we strongly encourage you to have a legal opinion to support your non-ERISA status. And I know for our clients, they've all gone through that step just so they have that additional protection. Uh, the other is understand that it is safe to follow ERISA guidance. There's an official ruling. It's, it's right here on the, on the page that was issued by the IRS. And... You know, so don't feel like if you're following ERISA guidance, that's that's going to put you at risk for being labeled a, an ERISA plan. Um, the one final point I would make here is just make sure you separate out what is an ERISA requirement versus IRS. Just because you have a, a non-ERISA plan, that, that doesn't also exempt you from IRS requirements. So please always make sure you separate out those two. So process and documentation, as I said, you know, here's, here's your key points uh, to follow. Understand that you can only be held responsible for the information that's available at the time that you're making a decision. So you, know, you, you may select a fund for your plan, all of a sudden things don't work out for that fund as you had hoped because uh, there, there are just things that happen out there on the market you didn't anticipate you are protected with regard to your initial decision as long as you went through a prudent process and you took into account all information that was available when you made that decision. However, uh, fiduciaries are also responsible for that ongoing, ongoing monitoring uh, relative to those decisions. So also please understand that you, you, you can't just make a decision and say, well, we made the de best decision based on the information of the time and walk away from it. You do have to maintain that oversight responsibility with new information that becomes available to you in the future. Then the three points at the bottom, we just like to point out, for, if you had to ever go through a DOL audit, you can expect that these are three items that, that uh, may be asked of you. And they're not required but it really sends up a red flag if you don't have an investment policy statement, if you don't have proof of uh, meetings that you've held and minutes documenting that, and then fiduciary training is, is a big one as well, just showing that for those who are responsible for the oversight of the plan that there's a formal process in place 
to help keep everybody educated on their responsibilities. And you could even use today's training as, as documentation in your minutes in order to indicate you did attend certain kind of fiduciaries. So take credit for your attendance today and, and you know, take, and indicate that in your documentation and keep some of these as a part of your, your fiduciary folder of the types of things that your, your team attended as a, as, a, as a benefit to you. Yes, absolutely. So when we talk about meeting minutes, do's and don'ts. Uh, you know, the, the keys are that you're including what was considered in your decision process, what were those key factors driving decisions, and then what specifically was approved. It, you don't need to record, and we don't recommend recording the exact vote, just that this is what was approved. And, and you know, going down to what not to include, you know, just to, to give a little bit of a silly example, you know, you wouldn't want to record that, well, Susan disagreed with Bob's viewpoint and voted against this approved change. I mean, that, that's just opening the door. You know, those minutes become discoverable that there was conflict of, over this decision to begin with, and you certainly wouldn't want to have that documented. Key fiduciary concepts. So, you know, for, for your retirement committee, if there was one page to focus on, just to, to help get everybody onboarded, this would be the page, you know, two key items, the exclusive benefit rule, basically, you know, you're obligated to act in the best interest of participants. There's an exception to that, which I'm sure will apply to, to, to many committees, if not all out there, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but in general, you want to always be acting in the best interest of your participants. And then the prudent person rule, it's a, ERISA actually 1974, it's a prudent man rule. Um, but uh, it, it basically is holding you to an expert standard. And, and that's why you hire outside providers. That's why you have an auditor for your plan, a record keeping provider, you go to ERISA counsel when appropriate and also look to engage an outside consultant or advisor because you are held to that expert standard. Another key concept here, diversifying investments and recognizing today we're talking about for def defined contribution plans. So you're not making the investment selections for your participants, but you are determining what investments are available to them. And ERISA guidance in this area, is, it's still basic. It basically says you have to offer three diversified fund options to meet the requirement. Obviously, knowing what you know today, you want to take that further. Um, you know, now that we have target date funds or life cycle funds, as many of you may know them, it's good to have those available as that single investment option for those less sophisticated investors to get them on the right track. Uh, separately, when you're looking at for those who want to be able to select their own investments and, and build their own portfolio, you would want to go well beyond three options. You know, recognizing today, you know, the, the, the sophistication level of some investors out there and what funds are available, uh, you know, we, we would expect you would look at having anywhere from, say, 10 to 20 funds, but trying to balance out that diversification opportunity versus participant confusion. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here down the road. Uh, administering the plans in accordance with their stated terms. And, and Karen had already touched on this, but I just want to point out when in doubt, consult the plan document. When at all in doubt, if you're not 100% sure what your plan document is telling you, we strongly encourage you to go to ERISA counsel. You know, seek out an expert opinion. That's where we see, uh, you know, just unknowingly sometimes some mistakes are made where there's just a, unfortunately an interpretation of a plan document that just isn't quite right and, and that can lead to problems. So please don't hesitate when uncertain to, to go to ERISA counsel. And then the last point I just wanted to say again here on this page, ERISA is more concerned with the process that is followed. So again, your, your best defense is to follow a well-defined investment selection and monitoring process. And I emphasize monitoring. Again, you have to, you have to, uh, to look at those decisions after the fact and see if, if uh, the investments you have made available are still appropriate. So I said I would come and revisit uh, times where maybe you won't be in a position to act in the best interest to your participants. So your employer, the plan sponsor may have charged you or your committee with looking at the plan design. You, know, you may, it may be over budget constraints. You may be looking to do things 
acting at that point in the best interest of your employer rather than your participants. I mean, that's a reality you may face. The key is that you recognize when you have taken off your fiduciary hat and you're now acting in this settler capacity. And you want to document that separately. So in your meeting minutes, we recommend noting in bold print, okay, the committee has now stepped over uh, away from their fiduciary functions and now for this plan design discussion is acting in a settler capacity. So some practical points, uh, again, just want to emphasize, you know, plan sponsor can never fully delegate away fiduciary responsibility. So when it comes to service providers, just like we talked about with investments, you need to have that well-defined process and document it in terms of the selection of service providers and then the ongoing monitoring as well. And then at the bottom, I just wanted to, to speak to that point of plan fees. Uh, it's just, again, it's important that you are on record that you're regularly reviewing your plan fees and as appropriate negotiating, uh, whether that's for your record keeper, for your audit, for your consultant, you want to show that, that, that there's a regular process in place. Um, and then for investments, taking that a little deeper, you want to make sure you've assessed all available fund uh, share classes that are out there and that and that you have appropriate share classes in place for your plan and as your plan grows and as more share classes become available that is something that could change over time so it's important that you, that you are assessing that on a regular basis and then documenting that assessment and, and document. that. take credit for the work you did with respect to that evaluation as we say process and documentation so in terms of well, what does that mean? You know, what does what does ERISA say in terms of the selection process and the monitoring? Well, there aren't real specific terms out there. There's nothing that says you have to go and conduct a request for proposal every two years or even a request for information. Um, certainly, if, it, if it, that's something that you haven't done for your plan, you've never gone out for an RFP or an RFI, we would strongly encourage you to get that, that process in motion. It's certainly something you should do from from time to time. But let's say you're in a position where you recently negotiated plan fees with your record keeper, but you know now a year or two have passed, you're happy with their service, you don't have a real uh, need for uh, looking to make a switch, you still want to show that you're regularly benchmarking your fees and services to ensure that they're appropriate you know, in light of recent changes out there, either in your plans, economics, or in just the competitive environment out there. So at a minimum, every couple of years, you at least want to, to be doing some kind of benchmarking. And again, as Karen would say, document that. Sorry, the auditor in the room can't resist the documentation yeah. comments. And, and the one last thing, I, as I'm flipping over from back from that last page, you know, it's not about having the lowest fees. It's about having fees that are reasonable for the services that are provided. That's what you need to, to be able to justify. So again, I, on this page, I think really have, have spoken to, to most of, of what we have here in terms of the service provider monitoring. Um, again, re just recognize that you want to Go out and get competitive information at time, and another method is to, to go out to, uh, if you can get a benchmarking relative to peer plans that have similar type plans, and, and databases can be a good source for that as well, and certainly that's a service that we provide to our, our clients on an ongoing basis. Bill, when you, when you see the benchmarkings done, how often are you seeing the plan sponsors come away with a more competitive pricing model, are you typically seeing that that allows them to adjust the fees downward or or are they status quo? Is there a trend? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, you know, a lot of times when we're first engaged, there hasn't been a process that's been conducted for several years and the plan has grown significantly and you know, market factors have helped bring down the cost through technology and record keeping. So a lot of times that initial uh, review that we conduct does lead to significant cost savings, which is a benefit to the plan and also positions you better uh, for, for fiduciary protection. After that point, you know, unless you're seeing significant growth in the plan or some significant change in your service level requirement, you know, you're probably not going to see another big pricing uh, change just within the next couple of years. 
So the uh, the investment selection here again, we we've already discussed a lot of this. Just a couple of points I, I want to hit on here: uh, the investments role and the plan's overall investment strategy. We always think this is a, a key point. Uh, we've had times where when we're first engaged, where we we find clients have put a lot of funds on the menu, and and sometimes there's there's overlap in certain categories, and we just are concerned that that could lead to uh, unintended participant confusion. On the other end of that, sometimes the menu has a couple gaps and we want to make sure that, that, that we're filling those with, uh, with investments to offer better diversification opportunity. And then the bottom point, just wanted to speak to that with regard to target date funds, you want to take your analysis to a deeper level versus say a large cap value fund. You, know, you, you want to look at the glide path uh, for for that fund in terms of the, the strategy of how that fund changes its investment allocation over time and you want to pay attention to the asset allocation mix within that strategy understanding that all of these target date funds or life cycle funds are what we call funds of funds some may have five or six funds uh, that are part of that strategy some may, may have 20 or more and it's just important that you're assessing that understanding that and that's part of your decision process I think one, one point that I wanted to mention on the monitoring your service provider not necessarily on the investment side is that we often see that some of our plan sponsors aren't necessarily reviewing the SOC 1 report that they receive from their service provider and that maybe it's the auditor in the room again but that actually you know, provides all the controls that your service organization had laid out and engages another auditor to test those controls and then document any deviations as well as, as telling the plan sponsors what their expectation of controls are supposed to have in place um, in order to make sure that, that they have controls in place uh, in order to make sure the process is running smoothly. And, and so we often see some of that aspect not necessarily being used, but it's a, we think it's a great roadmap to gauging how well your, your vendor is doing. If you see a lot of exceptions out there, then there might be some gaps of areas that you need to shore up in your own procedures to sort of augment what that service provider is looking at. I don't know, Bill, if you see that SOC 1 report topic similarly. No, agreed. Clients. Very, very important. And that's something that, that we conduct reviews on behalf of our clients. Absolutely. Yeah, those are so fun to read, too. Yes. <laughs> I didn't say I do, I said we do. Um, so moving on to investment policy, you know, we talked about the importance of having an investment policy statement in place. At the same time, don't make that too restrictive. You know, we encourage you to, to put some leeway in there because it's difficult, frankly, if not impossible, to account for every decision factor in advance. You know, you do want to identify those measures, both qualitative and quantitative, that are important and that will be reviewed, but you wouldn't want to put yourself in a corner where you're basically laying out in your policy to say, well, if this and this happen, we will replace the fund. Because, again, you, you can't foresee everything and, and you want to at least give yourself some leeway there. The other critical point here, uh, the second point on it is, is independence. Uh, you know, want to make sure you have that full independence in terms of review of investment managers. You know, for example, you're with a record keeper, they have their own funds. You know, you really don't want to be showing that you're relying on that record keeping provider who's tied to the investment manager and, and that, that that is your a big part of your review process. It's it's very important to have that that independence. The fiduciary rule, and I think we probably are all a little exhausted on everything we've heard about the fiduciary rule the last two years, but I just want to make a couple of quick points here. Uh, recognize where there are conflicts of interest, and, and you may have already had some uh, discussions and even documentation put in front of you by your uh, providers dealing with the conflicts of interest, and, and that's really a big part of what the, the rule is meant to, to draw out. So just be careful to, to understand that relationship with your record keeper, with your advisor, and, and whether or not that potentially has changed. Uh, the other is advice versus education, and I have a slide in here a little later to, 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 to talk a little bit more to that, but um, that's a big part of this rule too, is creating that dividing line between what is constituting advice and, and what is, is education. And then the, the rollovers, um, I'll talk about that actually on the, on the next page as well. So uh, education versus advice. 
we just put some a couple examples on here to just give you that idea. We don't want everybody to be afraid to speak to their participants. You know, certainly feel free to give out good a good education uh, to your employees. Just being careful not to, to to give them that specific advice. And as you can see here, you know, certainly you you can point to what professional managers are are recommending. You can use your life cycle and target date funds to basically say, hey, here's what a professional manager recommends based on your age uh, you know you have to consider your time horizon in, in in terms of your investment strategy but shy away from saying I like this fund over that fund that that could put you where you don't want to be and, and you're taking on additional fiduciary responsibility rollovers are a big component of this as well and only only the individual can really decide what is best for him or her and we always say look at the costs available in in the plan the available investment options and the services relative to another plan you could be considering rolling over to or to an individual retirement account or IRA and, and make sure you have all your information assess those against each other and then decide what is best for you but, but that again that's an education point uh, helping your employees understand what they need to know and then it's up to them to make that decision I think we're ready for our, our last polling question of the day. So, which country can be credited with the creation of the holiday favorite, which is eggnog? Um, letter A, England, France, Germany, or Switzerland? So we'll give folks a minute to, to log into that. Um, really wanted to thank everybody for, for t attending today. If you have any other questions, um, our, our contact information will appear on the next slide once we move beyond the polling questions. And then we are certainly available for questions after the, um, you know, after the presentation as well. You know, once you start getting rolling with the uh, plan document updating, I know there's going to be a number of questions that come out uh, of that process. And if you're like me, you always think of questions after the fact. Um, so we will have our information here in a moment in order to uh, to provide some ongoing guidance. So, so the answer to the eggnog question is England. Um, so wanted to share that little tidbit of information with folks. Um, and then I did I had one last oh, thought on the on the looking forward. Uh, you know, we talked about the independence. I'll also recognize, you know, when you're looking to conduct uh, benchmarking on whether it be your investments or your fees, We've actually run into cases where you know we, we've had uh, potential clients tell us, well, we, we've had our fees reviewed by our record keeping fees reviewed by our record keeper. You know, obviously, again, you don't have that independence there, so you want to make sure there's no potential conflict in that that process. And then uh, the final item, just an additional thought in terms of fee fairness, something that we're we're seeing. Uh, a lot more of now is trying to make sure you've got those fees leveled out in your in your plan. Uh, so if you have investments that have a revenue sharing component where it's used to collect fees for the plan, uh, we've seen some plans position in a way where there's a big difference based on investment selection in terms of what each participant pays. So we would encourage you to be very intentional about what your fee policy is you know whether it's flat fee, whether it's a percentage of assets, a combination of the two, and look to make changes in your plan to to align with the policy you develop. Okay. Well, again, I appreciate everybody's uh, attendance today and giving us the opportunity to talk about something that we spend all of our time on uh, as well. So uh, we're glad to be a continuing resource for our folks, and please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you know, as questions may come up, and. You know, those of you doing the evaluation for CPE purposes, please also take it as an opportunity to provide any feedback that you have on today's presentation. We're always looking at ways to improve the education that we're doing for clients as well as if you guys have any um, desire for other topics, we're always interested also to hear what you'd like to hear about versus what we think you would like to hear about as well. So thanks again for everybody's time today and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.